Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Dr. Stephen Gundry. I actually recently had a request to perform videos on doctors or members of the mainstream medical establishment, let's say, or at least the narrative, and the mainstream members within the health influencer sphere that are higher up in the echelon socially and in some cases authoritatively. Particularly Peter Atia was referenced as a prototypical example of that. Peter Atia has not yet been featured on this channel, however, neither has Dr. Stephen Gundry, so we're going to go ahead and perform a video on him. But before we get started, I would like to first of all welcome my new subscribers from Bart K's channel. I started out before the premiere of my interview with Bart, which I am attempting to have released this week at some point, with 305 subscribers, I think, and now I'm up to, last I checked, 805. I've gained 500 subscribers, so thank you very much for subscribing to the channel and welcome aboard, and thank you, Bart K, for featuring me on the channel. So I just wanted to start out by saying that, and also, before we get started, please remember, remember to subscribe to the Patreon. I have a $1 a month tier, a $5 a month tier, and an $8 a month tier. In order to gain access to one week early uploads, one extra video per week, ad-free content, uncensored content, and unblurred pop-up references on screen. References on screen are blurred. I may very well change that actually very soon. In fact, by the time this video's out, it may actually be changed. So, with that being said, let's jump right into this video. It is called Heart Health Tips Debunked. The truth about common heart healthy foods and myths. Dr. Stephen Gundry. Why does he think that he is remotely competent and cerebral and safe? enough to speak upon this topic? I have no idea. Maybe because he's a heart surgeon? That doesn't mean that you know anything about human nutrition and its effects on the heart. So let's go ahead and see what he has to say. Just because he is a doctor or a physician or a surgeon doesn't mean he's necessarily wrong about what he has to say. So let's just go ahead and see if he's correct or not. I want to set the record straight because chances are you'll see one of these heart health myths in just about every article you read. I know you want to stay healthy and I'm here to help. So what are you? So let's bust these heart health myths once and for all. Let's do so. Myth number one, you need to stop eating fatty foods. Yeah, that is false. That is a myth. What matters though is the type of fat that you are consuming and we'll get to that, I suspect, very soon. It is terrible for your heart. Yeah, false. The truth, some fats are terrible for your heart. Correct. We know which ones those are. Things like trans fats. Overall, yes, but there are certain trans fats that are actually not the result of chemical processing like conjugated linoleic acid that really are still natural. They're naturally occurring in things like ruminant animal meat, which is what we are designed to subsist off of primarily. Hydrogenated vegetable oil. Yeah, that's the rancid, insalubrious nonsense, yes. Oils derived from lectin-heavy ingredients like... Okay, you are hyperfixated on lectins, Dr. Gundry. There are other plant toxins. In fact, there's thousands that affect human beings. Why he can't get his head wrapped around that unequivocal, unambiguous fact, it bemuses me. Flour or peanut oil. Okay, yeah, those are contraindicated. However, all plant oils are, and that includes fruit oils like olive oil and avocado oil. The only one that seems to be pretty benign is coconut oil. In fact, I actually have some. You just have to source it properly. Other fats have actually been shown to help boost your heart health. Well, that's also technically a false fact because help is a cause and effect term and there are no studies to inform upon the risk of any heart health outcome or the benefit or hazard of any food or dietary intervention as it relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time. Throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed, there never has been and there never will be. The reason for this is because to establish a cause and effect relationship within the field of human nutrition science, which isn't science at all, it's theology and I'm about to explain why. You have to take two genetically identical twins, both phenotypically and genotypically typically identical, separate them at birth, put them into two metabolic ward lock-in rooms, observe them over their entire lives if attempting to infer lifelong health outcomes, 40 years for 40 year long health outcomes, etc., and control for every single variable including the time they wake up, the time they go to bed, their stress levels, their hormone levels, the time they eat, etc., etc., etc. It's implausible for obvious reasons, however, it's also unethical and also is exorbitantly expensive. It cannot be done and it never has been done. You cannot establish whether a fat is helpful via that type of science, therefore. I'm not going to deny that there are some judicious inferences that you can make if the study was done as responsibly as it could be. However, studies within the field of human nutrition science are very often bought and paid for, and even if they aren't, still have conflict of interest with the opinions of authors, if they're not peer-reviewed. And even if they are peer-reviewed, the peers concerned are indoctrinated, trained monkeys by the ventriloquists at the upper echelons of society and authority, aka universities and university professors, because Big Pharma dumps money into classes and dumps money into universities in order to skew the information that's being promulgated and taught and foisted upon the individuals that have 
have entered the universities have applied. Not to mention the fact that you cannot randomize properly a study to that degree either, really. They don't do that at all. It's very poorly randomized. They are very poorly randomized studies as well. It's just nonsense. And if you're talking about epidemiology, that isn't science at all either. There are seven flaws of epidemiology I can cite right now. And you should actually try to eat more of them. I'm talking about fats like olive oil. And no, olive oil is constituted primarily of monounsaturated fatty acids, just like ruminant animal fat is as well. However, my opinion is that monounsaturated plant fats are quite different than monounsaturated animal fats and the ratios are different. We didn't evolve to eat olive oil primarily. I do believe that it's far more benign and innocuous than the other oils that you just referenced, Stephen Gundry. However, it's still not what we're designed to eat. And also there is quite a substantial amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids in olive oil as well. It's the second primary consumer constituent, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, as we know, are inflammatory, biochemically speaking. It has to do with the cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase enzymes present within the body, and how they interact with them, the products that they form after the interactions with those enzymes, which are causally inflammatory. There's three primarily. So no, Stephen. Gorilla seed oil. No. Any plant-derived oil do not eat. Insalubrious, contraindicated. Eat animal fat. Straight hydrocarbon chains, biochemically speaking, with respect to the saturated fat contained within it. Butter, tallow, lard, suet, and ghee wild-caught seafood, and avocado. Wild-caught seafood, quite taming with unsaturated fatty acids, so still not optimal. Seafood itself, wild-caught seafood and properly sourced seafood, can constitute about 10% of your carnivorous diet. I say can. I mean, you can do whatever you want. It should, in my opinion. 10% of your carnivorous diet should consist of anything besides ruminant meat, I should say, really. So if you eat other foods that are not ruminant meat besides seafood, the aggregation of all of those other foods should constitute, in my opinion, up to 10% maximum of your 100% carnivorous diet. That's an optimal, that is a goal. Truth is, omega-3 fatty acids are actually connected to reducing the risk of heart disease. No, not risk. Already covered that. Next. And stroke. No, not risk, Stephen. Not risk. Where are your studies? I'll eviscerate them. That's one of the reasons I eat an avocado just about every day. Well, there's also fiber that is associated with that avocado. And fiber is also a contraindication in the human diet, no matter what form it comes in, but insoluble fiber is the worst. It is the most insalubrious. There are only two associated factors when it comes to diverticulosis, for example, which is an outpouching or breaking down of the distal colon, which can lead to infection or early death if left untreated, which is increased fiber intake and increased number of bowel motions per day. Please refer to the 2012 study, which was the only study posted in the American Journal of Gastroenterology that even remotely attempted to control for confounding variables with respect to dietary fiber intake and its efficacy or its inferentially derived efficacy to ameliorate idiopathic constipation. And you'll see something quite grim with respect to what we've been taught. And I suggest my patients do the same. Here's my well, what gives you the right to have patients that you consult with on a nutritional basis? You have the right to set up your private practice, but what makes you think that that's appropriate? Favorite. Myth number two. You need to eat more whole grains for a healthy heart. That is a myth. Whole grains contain phytates, which aren't actively damaging in terms of inducing tissue damage in the body, but they are conducive to manifesting and effectuating nutrient deficiencies within the body, within the physiological system in which they are introduced into. They particularly bind to iron and zinc, but interestingly enough, intriguingly enough, not the iron and zinc found in meat. But if you're a plant-based eater, phytates will definitely be a problem for you. But the most salient compounds that we're speaking upon here, or that I'm speaking upon, are lectins and oxalates. Now, Gundry knows about lectins. He knows about oxalates too, but he perfunctorily dismisses them. The thing about oxalates is that really in the form of plants, they come in oxalic acid. They come in the form of oxalic acid. And then when they're consumed, they react with three particular minerals within the body, primarily calcium, but also zinc and magnesium. And they form salts, chemically speaking. And then they form them in the form of oxalates, which then crystallize to form raphides, which are smaller than your cell membranes and obliterate your cell membranes upon impact. And also 80% of all kidney stones are calcium oxalate crystals because they're excreted through the kidneys. So anyway, oats, not your friend. Also the fiber associated as well. And it's in the form of insoluble fiber, which can't even remotely be fermented or broken down even in the slightest by your body. So once again, that's why my opinion is that it's the worst. So I'm pretty sure this lie was created by food companies who wanted to sell more whole grain. Oh, uh, you're pretty sure? Because here's the thing, it's dead wrong. Yes, correct. But whole grain cereals, brown rice, bread, and a whole assortment of unhealthy foods have been marketed using the heart healthy label. Yes. We also know that the American Heart Association received a grant from Procter & Gamble, the creators of Crisco, to even get started in the first place. 
to develop and then finally ossify into what it is today. So they're going to say things like this. They started fraudulently. Even foods loaded in sugar and lectins. And even yes, well, sugar, all carbohydrates are sugar. So and even the American Heart Association has hopped on the heart healthy whole grains bandwagon. Why are you saying that like that's a recent action of theirs or a recent position that they've taken and posited? That's but when you look at the diets of people with the lowest instances of heart disease, feels Okay, well, that's not what you should do in order to derive conclusions that are conducive to determining what is indicated dietarily and lifestyle-wise for a human being. Okay, that is an association because whatever these people are eating, it does not necessarily mean that the food is causing it. How many confounding variables are there? That they have one thing in common. N no, whatever you're going to say, no, they have many things in common. They actually don't eat a lot of whole grains. Great. Reductionism in the extreme. I'm not pretending that whole grains are something that you should eat. But what I'm saying is just because another population doesn't eat them doesn't mean that that's the cause of their longevity. <laughs> France actually tops the list. And they do eat a lot of bread in France. But most of it is made with refined white flour. Which is also insalubrious. Dr. Gundry. Carbohydrates. In fact, all of the carbohydrates that are yielded from the digestion and the metabolism of starch that you were just referring to is glucose. And in Japan, white rice is common. Yes, but once again, contra indicated. Fun fact though, white rice, particularly white basmati rice, I don't know if it matters too much, but that is, in my opinion, the least toxic carbohydrate to consume if you are going to consume a carbohydrate that is derived from food. Because of course, the least toxic carbohydrate that I can think of is just mixing some glucose powder into some water. But why would you do that? Brown rice is practically unheard of. The takeaway, eating whole grains won't keep your heart healthy. Correct. But eating a diet rich in omega-3 fats? No, because it depends on what those omega-3 fats are constituted of in the first place, where they're derived from. And also, we're actually not designed to have an enormous level of omega-3s or even just an abundant level in our diets. We are designed to have a very limited amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids, okay? Leafy green vegetables? No, Dr. Gundry. Oxalates. Also polyphenols, something that you tend to be beneficial based on reductionist epidemiology, which once again is not science. Polyphenols have been shown to have the capacity and capability, really, to damage DNA within human cells. Resveratrol, curcumin found in turmeric, resveratrol found in red wine, curcumin particularly in the gastric mucosa of human beings. They are plant antioxidants, but only antioxidants for the plant. And polyphenols will. So, Look to the Mediterranean diet or even the Oka. No. Also, what the f is the Mediterranean diet? Define that, Stephen. There are a myriad of diets consumed within the Mediterranean region. What scientists did is they analyzed the Mediterranean population epidemiologically. They found certain health outcomes and compared it to health outcomes in the United States and then reduced the reasoning as to why these people lived longer or died less grim deaths to their diet when there's a myriad of other confounding variables and then reduced it even further to very certain foods, very particular foods, on the basis of opinion, aggregated those foods together and said, this is the Mediterranean diet. No! diet for heart health inspiration and leave the whole grains on the table. This shouldn't be on the table anyway. Myth number three, eating high cholesterol foods will raise your cholesterol. That is a myth. However, if you are on a diet that is bereft and destitute of exogenous cholesterol and you go back to a diet that consists of quite a bit of cholesterol or the constituents for cholesterol production, which is primarily acetyl-CoA, not saturated fat, but saturated fat creates acetyl-CoA, but so does glucose. It doesn't matter. Then the propensity for your cholesterol levels to rise is quite high, actually, but that's indicated. That's supposed to happen. Anyway, this is a begging the question fallacy anyway, because this indicates that raising your cholesterol is a bad thing. It's not. Your genes regulate your cholesterol levels. Nothing else does. In fact, the only way that you can really meaningfully manipulate your cholesterol is by lowering it, by either taking statins, which are mitochondrial poisons that damage the CoQ enzymes within the mitochondrial membranes of your body or of your cells, or by not eating cholesterol, which foists an arduous task upon the body to create cholesterol endogenously at an upregulated rate. It's a subsistence mechanism. It is not supposed to be depended on. But anyway, it is technically a myth to say that eating 
eating high cholesterol will raise your cholesterol because there's plenty of people within the carnivorous space that eat high cholesterol foods, meat and eggs and all that, and don't really have a meaningfully high cholesterol level. It's because of the fact that any excess cholesterol is simply recycled or excreted as is indicated by the physiological system or the body at any given instance in time. If your body doesn't need that cholesterol, which will be dictated upon your genes and what they're encoded for and what they're encoded to do, it will be excreted or recycled for later use. It really is that simple. The truth when it comes to your cholesterol, you are not what you eat. Sure, doctors used to believe that eating foods like eggs and shellfish would raise your cholesterol to problematic levels. It's Okay, there's no such thing as a problematic cholesterol level. If it is exorbitantly high and enormously high, the cholesterol itself still does not become a problem. It's indicative of another problem, of something else going on within the body. In some cases, it seems ostensibly chronically low insulin. By low, I mean actually too low. Too low in order to effectuate the anabolic processes that need to be effectuated in the body, which won't happen on carnivore if you're eating enough protein. But also, second to that, your cholesterol can still be high compared to normative levels of the population and the strictures that are imposed upon such levels by misanthropic institutions if you eat no cholesterol at all, actually. My grandmother is one of these people. But the truth is, moderate intake of cholesterol-rich foods, yes, even things like egg yolks and shrimp, won't raise your cholesterol. And even if it does or did, it wouldn't matter because cholesterol is not causal in any disease process. Again, Take a look at the Japanese diet, one rich in shellfish. Okay, association again. Stop performing science this way because it's not scientific. Stop deriving inferences or conclusions based on inferences such as this. Look at biochemistry, human physiology, comparative anatomy, chemical anthropology, and inferential anthropology because you can make more judicious inferences and more astute ones with respect to that field than you can with human nutrition science and epidemiology. Look at evolution. Eggs and seafood. The Japanese have some of the lowest instances of heart disease in the world. Fantastic association, Dr. Gundry. Can you justify your reduction of that result to food, or even an individual one? No. Despite eating cholesterol-rich foods. That's fantastic. Because most of the cholesterol in your diet just can't be absorbed by your gut. And fact is absorbed actually plays a role in helping your body run smoothly. Fact. So go ahead, eat your omega-3 eggs, or your wild-caught seafood. What the hell is an omega-3 egg? Or your wild-caught seafood from time to time. Be careful with that, Mercury. You can thank humans for that and human intervention. Humans are capable of effectuating and manifesting much, much good in the world, and also much worse as well. When they're part of a balanced diet, they're... F okay, balanced diet is contraindicated. It's actually the worst diet that you can consume, right next to a vegan diet, that being the second worst. Look up the Randall cycle. Look into the Randall cycle, Dr. Gundry. Fine for your health. Myth number four. You need to work out for hours a week to improve heart health. No, you shouldn't do that. Inflammation is induced every single time you exercise. People over-exercise even with respect to resistance trainers, actually. Really, three times a week is the maximum amount that you should be working out. And if you provide the correct stimulus, the proper stimulus to the muscle, and you provide the proper stimulus to effectuate a muscle growth by eating proper foods that have adequate protein content and adequate fat content, etc., etc., and provide an adequate insulin response via the amount of protein contained within the food, then um, you don't need to worry about not growing muscle by working out only three times a week, actually. You'll still see benefit. In fact, you'll actually probably see enhanced muscular growth as compared to if you were to perform six times a week because you actually allow your body to heal from the injury. The truth, exercise is good for it. Depends. What kind of exercise are we talking about? Because if it's steady state, moderate intensity, long-term cardio exercise, or what is colloquially deemed cardio, it's actually damaging to the heart perniciously. You don't need hours of cardio to improve your heart health. Yeah, you don't want that. You don't do cardio at all. Burst and repeat sprinting is indicated, not steady state cardio. Zone two. Never train in zone two. Ever. In fact, extreme cardio, like running marathons, triathlons, or climbing mountains, can actually put more strain on your system than is healthy. Yes. Studies of triathletes have recently shown that it causes severe fibrosis of your heart. That's thickening like gristle in your heart. Doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Now, this isn't to say you should be a couch potato. Get active. But remember, 30 to 45 minutes a day is a good start. Of what? What kind of exercise are you referring to, Stephen? Especially if you're not used to a long workout routine. 
And it's fine to start by walking around the box or swimming laps at a pace that's comfortable to you. Okay. And you don't have to be in pain for your workouts to work. Myth number five. Mm. For a healthy heart, eat fruits and vegetables. No. Oxalates. Lectins. Which causally lead to inflammation. And inflammation is the underpinning etiology of not only heart disease, but heart disease relevant to this, but also every major killer in the entire Western world. And soon to be the entire world, actually. So. Wait. How is that a myth? It's the fruits part. No, it's the vegetables part too, Stephen. You could make the argument that fruits are worse, but it depends on who you are. Many times, fruits are better for people in terms of the way in which their body withstands the consumption of those foods. Absolutely should eat vegetables. No, you absolutely should not eat vegetables, Dr. Gundry. False. Fiber as well. And some in-season fruit is a... Tr no, you should not. That was relevant millions of years ago. It is no longer relevant now. But by putting fruit first, you're putting sugar first. Yes, correct. You see, this is the thing about Dr. Gundry. Half of what he says is true, and half of what he says isn't true. Honestly, more than half of what he says is not true. I'd say about 25% of what he says is true, however, which makes him arguably more dangerous than other people that are flat out incorrect. It's like Paul Saladino. And that Paul's worse. And that's bad for your heart health, your blood. Correct. It's bad for your entire body, cellularly. Your blood sugar? Well, no sh**. <laughs> how do you raise blood sugar to a contraindicated degree? In other words, how do you spike it? Oh, you eat sugar. Wow. Your kidneys? Correct. And your gut? Correct. So go ahead and eat plenty of vegetables. Incorrect. No. Especially things like cruciferous vegetables. No, glucosinolates, which break down enzymatically within the gastrointestinal tract into isothiocyanates, which actively compete for iodine at the thyroid, causing things like goiter, and in some cases, depending on the other plant compounds that are associated, Hashimoto's disease, an ostensible autoimmune attack on the thyroid, Dr. Gundry. No, goitrogens. Do you want to cause yourself thyroid issues and goiter? Go ahead and eat your cauliflower, your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, your cabbage, your kale, Eat kale if you want a healthy dose of thallium as well. Tubers like sweet potatoes or... No! Sugar! Carbohydrates! Particularly glucose, but also fiber! Resistant starch! So effectively the same as soluble fiber. Ferments into nasty byproducts. Or jicama. And leafy greens. No. No. Polyphenols. Once again, disparate operating systems. Plant antioxidants actually seem to be pro-oxidants within the human physiological system. Sulforaphane is one of them, in fact. You know, the compound that is cited as making broccoli anti-cancer or something because of sulforaphane's ability to kill all cells via oxidation, not only cancer cells. Sulforaphane doesn't discriminate on what cell it destroys. It just destroys. And also sulforaphane is one of the isothiocyanates I was referring to. So, great stuff. And when it comes to fruit, remember three things. Don't eat it. There you go. There's your three things to remember about fruit. Stop talking about fruit, Dr. Gundry. As a seed, it's a fruit. That includes things like peppers, tomatoes, and squash. True. Eat seed. Nightshades are one of the most toxic food groups. They are teeming with glucosinolates, which bind to the enzyme cholinesterase, which is responsible for breaking down acetylcholine. Therefore, this causes a rise of acetylcholine within the predator's muscles after consuming things that have a toxic level of glucosinolates in them, or a lethal level is what I should say. And an increase in acetylcholine concentrations will cause convulsions, paralysis, spasms, and ultimately respiratory arrest, and therefore early death. Of course, tomatoes are not teeming with a lethal amount of glucosinolates. However, they have an insidious, pernicious, gradual effect on one's physiology. Even if not immediate, it's called accrual. Maybe have a little citrus for dessert this time of year. You shouldn't do that, but a little tiny bit of anything really is not going to be that big of a deal. Or have some berries in the summer. Don't do that. Remember, fruit is nature's candy. Correct. That's a proper analogy, I believe. But treat it like candy. There you go. So don't f***ing eat it. The only fruit you can and should be eating every day is... Nothing. None. Whatever you're going to say, none. Avocado. No.
You talk about seasonal eating, and then you say that you should have an avocado every f***ing day. Do avocados grow 365 days a year, seasonally, without human intervention? No. Because it's all healthy fat. No. Health is the absence of disease process. Healthy means that the food concerned causes, or at least is conducive to leading to, an absence of disease process. Inferred from causal evidence, there is no evidence to support that f***ing claim. Steven! and protein and fiber, and it's- No, protein and fiber. Protein in an avocado? Wow. Wow. You're not getting any protein in an avocado, Stephen. That is chimeric, chimeric thinking. Hoped for, but illusory or impossible to achieve. You wish that you could derive all of your protein needs from carbohydrate-rich and fiber-rich foods. You can't do that, Stephen. This is amazing. Also, once again, fiber is a contraindication in the human diet. It is abrasive to the enteric nervous system. It upregulates mucus secretion due to its ability and due to its causal interactions with the gut with respect to abrading it, and also increases immune dysregulation, which also will increase mucus secretion. It ferments into nasty bright products like gluconeogenic precursors, for example, particularly lactate and acetate, which will migrate to the liver to be converted into glucose indirectly, raising one's glucose levels, perhaps, from instance, methane. Humans release methane too. Actually good for your heart. Okay, good for. Cause and effect. No. You know, despite modern advancement, heart disease remains the number one most common disease among Americans. Yes, correct. In fact, I believe it's 111 cases per 1,000 adults in the United States, according to the EPA. Heart disease rates have remained relatively stagnant from the years of 2002 to 2018. The prevalence rates. The mortality rates have decreased due to pharmaceutical intervention. But, of course, they'll do anything in their power to make it to where they can fix your mortality so that you can keep coming back to the hospital later on so they can profit off of you, because you only die once. It's the case of one in every five deaths. So, what's the big problem? Well, 42% of Americans are officially obese. Okay, obesity itself is not the cause of heart disease. It's a symptom of poor dietary input. It makes your body more of a salubrious environment for toxins and pathogens to flourish unscathed and untrammeled. Sure, due to inflammation, but it is not the cause of heart disease. Inflammation is. They're symptoms. They say fat in your gut, you're out of luck. So belly fat contributes directly to heart health. As I exp okay, what do you mean by that? Let's see what he expounds upon here. In all of my books, and I'm going to spend even more time in the upcoming book. But of course, you got another book coming out. Releases bacteria and bacterial particles. Lipokines, releases inflammatory compounds, yes. Abdominal adipose tissue is the most metabolically active adipose tissue. It's the most difficult to get rid of, and it does have hormonal effects. Sure. It causes a catch-22 situation when one is attempting to lose that fat, where you can actually perpetuate your obesity or overweight status because the fat molecules will exude inflammatory signals, and that will cause fat storage itself. So, once again, catch-22. It's difficult to get rid of, but if you're dealing with such a thing, and you're dealing with some stagnation on carnivore, which could be directly related to this phenomenon, I would suggest referring to the link on the screen below in order to further ameliorate your inflammation to give yourself that extra kick and extra punch that your body needs into your bloodstream and that sets up inflammation heart is correct is is not a problem of cholesterol heart correct heart disease is a problem of inflammation in blood vessels most correct realize that statin drugs don't work by lowering your cholesterol Correct. In fact, they actually just causally lead to issues because of, once again, the damage that they induce into the CoQ enzymes of the mitochondria. They poison them, and then they destroy them, which leads to the death of mitochondria, which leads to muscle pain a lot of times. And actually, this is what leads to the massive association, the market association you see with statin-taking populations and ALS, an invariably fatal condition. It's 11,500%. The same association you see within populations that smoke and the presentation within those populations of lung cancer drugs work by lowering the inflammation in your blood vessels. That is a serendipitous effect of statin drugs. It's an initial serendipitous effect. It has to do with the interactions of the cytokines within your mitochondria, the pro-inflammatory cytokines. It's an initial effect. Later on, they cause inflammation via the mechanism that I've just presented. Statin drugs actually don't work, Stephen. There's no evidence for that. In fact, the median life gained, quote-unquote, not gained, actually. I'm just using that word to be informal because gained is a cause-and-effect term. The median life that is ostensibly 
possibly gained from taking statins in populations of people that have had a history of heart disease is 4.1 days. And in populations of people that have not had a history of heart disease or have had a heart attack is 3.2 days. After aggregating all 11 relevant studies, which results in data from 90,000 participants, it's ridiculous. It's negligible. It's not worth taking. So no, they're not helpful. They don't work at all. What are you talking about? But there's lots of other easy ways to do it. So let's start with no. Yes, don't take statins. Eat the proper human diet. The species-appropriate, species-specific diet for human beings. That being 100% carnivore, consisting primarily of the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals. Saturated fat in the form of butter, tallow, lard, suet, and ghee added to taste. Salt to taste. And water, as established unequivocally and unambiguously by stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses conducted in 2019 on the collagen of the long bones of ancient human remains that showed that 80% of our effective fuel intake came from the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals, and the other 20% was inferentially speaking a subsistence method or a subsistence food or group of food, that being large fibrous tubers in order to derive saturated fat in the form of short-chain fatty acids, actually, because fiber is really fermented into short-chain fatty acids, which are only utilized in a focal part of the small intestine, not systemically either, so. For one, eat walnuts. F no. Where the f did you get this, Stephen? I know where you got it from. Reductionist epidemiology based on respondent data. Healthy user bias, unhealthy user bias. People lie, people forget. It's uncontrolled. The results are adjusted for at the end via multivariate regression, inflating the power of the result, but in many cases, changing the entire result, leading to something called fabrication, publication bias, arbitrary selection criteria, the problem of extrapolation. The results of epidemiological studies cannot be extrapolated to any group not studied, and usually these studies are performed on aged populations in order to ensure the occurrence of deaths in these studies. So if you're not 70 years old, God. First of all, fat does not make you fat. Not only does fat... No, it doesn't. Not necessarily. If you eat too much of it, which is honestly impossible to do on a carnivorous diet if bereft of associated carbohydrates. The only time that you can really easily overeat fat is if you combine it with sugar. So if you overeat fat, then it can't. De novo lipogenesis, fat storage. Not make you fat. But fats in the form- I'm sorry, not de novo lipogenesis. That's the creation of new fat. Carbohydrates induce that. Correction. Walnuts or an olive oil actually benefit heart health. Benefit is a cause and effect term, no. Also, fat is not the only thing contained within walnuts and the other oils that you just laid out. There are other toxins in it that outweigh the pros, even if that was a pro, and it's f***ing not. Walnuts are also a great source of a funny chemical called polyamines. Why is it funny? I've written- Do you see me laughing? I've written extensively about polyamines. Well, just because you've scriven it into a book doesn't mean that it is any way beneficial to the human body or necessary. It's been shown to increase your overall health. No, it hasn't. There are no studies to inform upon that. I already said that. And that's with respect to meat as well. You derive what is indicated to eat and how to live, dietarily, lifestyle speaking, with respect to human health and human behavior. You infer that from science, not pseudoscience or theology, that being human nutrition science or nutrition epidemiology. You infer that from chemical anthropology, biochemistry, human physiology, inferential anthropology, comparative anatomy, or health span, and longevity. Now, one no evidence covered that. Miracle fats. Okay, meretricious language to adorn and aggrandize your philosophy, to beguile people and lull people into your philosophy, your fallacious, erroneous philosophy, your jejun, vapid philosophy. In walnuts is actually a short chain omega-3 fat called alpha-linolenic acid. Okay, that is the precursor to DHA and EPA. What if you could get DHA and EPA directly from your food, therefore making it more bioactive and bioavailable, because your body doesn't have to arduously break it down through a conversion process, a very inefficient one? Oh yeah, you can! Where do you derive that fat from? Oh yeah, ruminant animal meat in perfectly sufficient, perfectly adequate amounts for human physiology. Created a and also, this doesn't even mention the fact that you are reducing the results of epidemiological studies to one fatty acid, not even one diet, not even one food, a short-chain fatty acid? Oh my god! L.A. And I promise there won't be a test. Oh. L.A. has been shown in numerous studies, including this one, but also in the Lyon Heart Diet Study, to dramatically lessen. 
the lesson false already, whatever he's going to say, whatever he's going to say. Incidence of coronary artery disease. No, it was not shown to lessen the incidence of. It was associated with a lower incidence of. You see how you just misrepresented that finding? What the hell? People who have coronary artery disease. ALA is present in walnuts. It's present in flax seeds. It's pre uh huh. It's a precursor to DHA and EPA. Docosahexaenoic acid and icosapentaenoic acid. Stephen Gundry. In organic canola oil, but it's present in my. Are you seriously suggesting people consume organic canola oil? My favorite oil for ALA, perilla oil. No one gives a shit what your favorite oil is to derive that reductionist compound. So any way you can get ALA into your diet, including walnuts, that's what to do. No, it's not what to do. I already explained what to do. If you don't know, please rewind the video. Now, alpha-linolenic acid is an essential fatty acid. If alpha-linolenic acid is only found in plants, and plants aren't essential for human beings, then it's not an essential fatty acid, is it? Stephen f***ing Gundry. Oh my gosh! We're about to be going for an hour. Once an hour is up, we're not watching this any longer. Does that mean? It means we don't manufacture it. But N Okay, essential does not mean we don't manufacture it. It means it's essential for human life and we can't manufacture it. Those two things have to have it to properly function cell membranes and mitochondrial membranes. No, you need DHA and EPA. Alpha linoleic acid is a precursor. It goes through a conversion process and your body doesn't very efficiently break it down into DHA and EPA. It is not essential, Stephen. That is a lie. You have just lied to your audience here. You've lied to all of my viewers. You are a liar. End of. Anyway, okay, we're done with this video. This video is 34 minutes and four seconds. We got eight minutes and 48 seconds through. Already so many lies, but I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, please leave your thoughts in the comment section below and also most importantly subscribe to the patreon i have a one dollar month tier once again five dollars and eight dollars a month i don't know if anyone's gonna be missing five dollars a month honestly you lose more than five dollars a month than you spend it let's be real so i'd greatly appreciate the donation i am trying to raise money and i'm working with my partner in order to actually move down to florida even just renting a house there so i can expedite my treatment processes if you want to know what i'm getting treated for please check out my video on my channel called who am i it elucidates and explains that thoroughly so I greatly appreciate even just $1 a month, but $5 a month, you get all of the perks, such as ad-free content, uncensored uploads, etc., etc. Rewind to the beginning to find out all of those or refer to the description or pinned comment below. But also, as I referenced earlier in the video, please refer to the Cerule link at the bottom of the screen in order to help yourself ameliorate any inflammation that one may still be plagued with even after adopting a carnivorous diet. A lot of things are accrued diseases and sometimes need an extra punch or an extra kick in order to effectuate its amelioration or its alleviation. So please refer to those if you want more information on those, which I would encourage you do. Do not just buy anything cursorily or impetuously. Please refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen. Again, the Cerule video that I did, Cerule products video. It explains those once again thoroughly. So I'd appreciate buying through that link. I get a small commission, $5 for anyone that purchases through that link. So and I also do not get paid to advertise the product if anyone is curious. Buy my book when that is out, Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that are perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century. We're trying to get that out very soon. That was supposed to be out by March 1st, but if you want any reasonings as to why that hasn't actually occurred, it has to do with my publishing company. It's going to be published under my name, but they're still helping me publish the book. And they're just incompetent, to be fair. I'm a very forgiving person, and I cannot forgive this. Sorry. But anyway, follow me on Instagram, TikTok before I'm taken down, which I suspect it's going to be very soon. And also Twitter, especially, I'm going to subscribe to xbasic, $3 a month, that's nothing, to be able to upload the videos that you're seeing right now on YouTube onto Twitter as well. And the reason I'm doing such a thing is because if I ever get taken down on YouTube, there is another platform for you guys to watch on. Email me as well at edgookie14 at gmail.com if you have any questions or would like to request that I react to certain videos. I have a superfluous stash in my abditory on YouTube. However, I am of course going to go ahead and put those aside to cater towards the audience and to tailor my content towards what the audience demands. So that being said, join me next time when someone else conveys and demonstrates their incompetence with respect to human nutrition science, biochemistry, human physiology, etc. So see you then.